Hello, welcome, thank you for being here. Uh, my name is Alex Coulomb. I'm the creative director of Agile Lens Immersive Design. We're a New York City-based consultancy. And uh, today we're gonna be talking about interactions between architecture and VR. And just a super quick background on me, um, I wanna mention uh, just a little bit about my history because it'll all play into the stuff I'll be showing today. Um, my first real passion was theater. Back in 2005, I, I wrote a play that had like 100 light cues. It was a musical with a three-piece band and it was insane and things have only gotten more crazy since then. Um, I started a theater group in architecture school where we were just architects making theater, which was really cool. And then um, started working for proper architecture firms, started to get really really excited about new technologies like augmented reality in 2009. It became a part of my thesis, which was this crazy reinterpretation of Fort J on Governor's Island in New York City. Um, theater again playing into excitement there. I also started to explore game design mechanics when I really didn't want to throw away these beautiful laser cut precision pieces of my uh, architecture models and was like, I got to do something with these and turn those into board games. And you might see how some of that plays into how I think about creating virtual excuse me, virtual reality experiences. Um, and then started working for a few other architecture firms. Fisher Dax Associates is a firm that exclusively designs theaters, and I've been doing a lot of work with them. And then we go into Agile Lens as well as all the stuff that we are going to talk about today. I don't want to spoil the surprise. So, virtual reality and architecture. My goal for this presentation is really to review some very specific use cases of virtual reality having a meaningful impact on the design of architecture. I think uh, it's still a pretty underutilized medium, and in addition to ways that we've already found uh, productivity in using it as a tool, I also want to project into the future and discuss a little bit about what I think is coming with uh, virtual reality in the years to come as we think about you know, designing spaces that are never gonna be built. More on that later. So I used to think that it was pretty easy to get someone acquainted with the process of building virtual reality. I would tell them, hey, architect or archivist person, you already know how to make textures and models and put all that together into a nice render. Well, if you're gonna do a virtual reality experience, really all you gotta do at that point is add more textures and lights and materials, and then, you know, a couple clicks in V-Ray, and then you have a 360 experience. And guess what? If you want to make it a fully navigable experience, there's a tutorial, uh, then all you have to do is keep adding lights and textures and models, and then, voila, you have a full 3D model with everything you need to walk around. And then, you know, you optimize it a little bit and get out to a bunch of platforms. I thought that for a number of years, building virtual reality experiences. But then it occurred to me, as I thought more about this and saw the kinds of experiences that were being generated with that level of advice, that uh, there's more to it than that because this is still a very early medium, and this is my excuse to put my oldest son in my presentation, and what is happening is that VR is still in very early days. It's a language that hasn't been worked out yet. Um, I think about the early days of film and the innovation that happened there and the practical use of it, as well as how far it's come since then. So for those who don't know, this is the first film, it's a horse running, and there was a very practical application to this. From this film, we knew for the first time ever that when a horse is running, all four of its feet are in the air. So that was like a very practical use case, but when you think about the language of film with cuts and close-ups and wide shots, that took a very long time to develop. If you imagine trying to show someone from even the 1920s, like a Mission Impossible film, I don't think they'd be able to follow anything going on. We can understand that because we've uh, gotten accustomed to the language of film. And so when I think about how everyone will think about virtual reality many years from now when the language has been more developed, they're gonna think that the time we're in now, about 2019, is right about there. So we're kind of starting to work out you know, the spine of, of what this wants to be, but there's still a, a long way to go. And so interactions between architecture and virtual reality with some other thoughts put towards theater and stagecraft and what comes with that, as well as game design. Those kind of get sprinkled in, but let's keep it focused because interactions also are, to a certain extent, game design. You're thinking about how people are behaving in a space with certain rules and conditions and possibly rewards. 
we're going to focus on the architecture and virtual reality part. So the first interaction between architecture and VR, one that I think a lot of people recognized when the medium first started to become more widespread, was visualization. You know, how great to be able to have a 3D model of something and put on a VR headset and look around and feel like you're there. That's really great. Um, here's a project that just opened, the Statue of Liberty Museum on Liberty Island with FX Collaborative, formerly FX Fowl. Um, and this was like just a really quick idea of like, hey, they're done with the design, now we just wanted to see what it would look like. So we took the finished design and looked at it in VR. Really cool, um, but not really using VR to its fullest potential. So hopping right along to something that I started to find a lot more use case in, which is using VR to explore design options and make good choices based on what you experience. So one of my first introductions to this was dealing with the problem of sight lines in theaters and figuring out, okay, if we're iterating on different designs for a theater and we're looking at different seat views and different ways that those seats can be arranged, how do we make up our minds about the best way to um, position those or, or you know, where the seat should go and how many of them there should be. And it used to be back when I joined Fisher Dax in 2012 that you know, we'd produce a lot of this kind of stuff where it's like, okay, here's the same seat with four different options for how it works. And if you're trained, you can look at this image and kind of have a good sense of what's working and what isn't. But to a layman or a client or certain collaborators, I'd get a lot of comments where someone would say like, well, you know, do I have a laser pointer? You guys can't see it, but like, you know, in this one if some, or that one, people might be like, that head looks really close. And they'd say like, that's gonna be really uncomfortable having someone's head that close. And you'd be like, no, it's three feet away, it's fine. And I'd find, and I, I hear this from other architects as well, that we'd spend a lot of time trying to justify our expertise and just trying to convince people that we know what we're talking about when we recommend or don't recommend certain options. And so right away, virtual reality was a way to just feel more confident about the direction a design is and when reviewing different design options, knowing uh, which ones work best. And so similar as before, virtual reality, you pop in, you feel like you're in the theater, but then if you can cycle through different options, it's a really good way to just have a clear sense of what's working. And in this case, this is the DK1, so there wasn't even motion tracking. I actually had um, you know, controls in there for like simulated leaning. Um, but once the DK2 came along, we had a really nice uh, ability to be able to lean and see how that would affect our design decisions, which was great. This is 2013, very early days. And so the first project we did this on was called the Sichu Center for Chinese Opera in West Calhoun, China. And we got a really nice response from Big Tom Architects who we were working with. This was a very curvy design with a lot of stuff going on and a lot of nuance to the swoop of the railing. And to be able to evaluate a lot of different options in VR, even just by clicking through them, was a really excellent way to make our you know, best decisions. Uh, another kind of extension of that uh, is The Late Show Stephen Colbert. There's a project with Bravo Media where before The Late Show was going to open, Stephen Colbert wanted the whole ceiling or the dome of the Ed Sullivan Theater to have this kind of Sistine Chapel feel. And that had to be done with architectural projection because you, you can't paint it. And so we used VR as a way to very quickly kind of treat the sight lines that a person would have similarly to a projector and generate uh, the locations and the number and the throw distance of those projectors very fast. So just just kind of taking that previous knowledge and mixing it together, which should be a bit of a theme of this talk. Uh, similarly, taking a lot of those lessons as well, I started to look at production design in theaters, so not the architecture of the theaters, but actual shows going inside them. Uh, the Park Avenue Armory in 2014 had a production of Macbeth from Kenneth Branagh that was transferring over from Manchester, and again, very rapid time schedule, had to make some very fast decisions about what was going to work or not work in everything from the seating conditions to the, uh, the railing options to the blocking of the actors and the set design and the lighting, and to be able to mock that up very quickly inside VR was really useful. So right now, at this stage of what we're calling Interaction 2, there's kind of this workflow where you start on your computer and you pop into VR and you evaluate something, and then you go back to your computer and then you make the changes, and then you look at it again in VR and it's kind of this back and forth, back and forth, and eventually uh, you end up making your building or design a reality, but ultimately that's coming from the computer. The actual design work for the most part is still happening in this two and a half D world uh, where again you might have certain decisions inside VR, but you're not actually carrying that information back to the, uh, the program. The, again, you're, you're actually doing the design work there. So the next interaction is going to be this notion of starting in a computer, 
going inside VR, and then actually making some, not all, because you don't want to spend all your time designing the VR, but having some decisions transfer from virtual reality over into the final design. And so I'm calling that inside-out design. And so the first time that I found uh, this kind of thing being really useful was for The Shed, which also recently opened in Hudson Yards in New York. We were working with Rockwell Group and Dillard Scafidio and Renfro. And this crazy building that I, I started working on in, I think, 2013, uh, which I had no, I did not believe it was actually going to happen, uh, had a crazy grid system. And so we needed a really quick way to understand that grid system better and to make very quick choices about where certain specialty equipment was going to go in that grid. So this was a very fast VR experience just built for the design team. We're not showing this to clients or the public or anything like that. And it, we had like this little scale model, and you see a four-foot stick and a seven-foot stick. And the reason that's there is because we knew that the specialty equipment that was going to go up in that grid needed either four feet of clearance or seven feet of clearance. And so as we moved around the space, it was a very quick way to just mark on the key plan in VR as we go, OK, yeah, yes, it can go here. No, it can't go here. And have those design decisions transfer more directly from VR into there. Visualization, this is getting a little bit meta because we're talking about using VR to create visualizations that might not necessarily be in VR. But using something like Unreal Engine's VR editor, you can actually start to do things like move the cameras around. And so even, let's just say you're just doing a 2D animation like this, you can actually do all of that from inside virtual reality as you start to plan out your shots and change the field of view. Um, it's kind of an exciting tool. And now to do a little bit of a deep dive into one project, the Rice University Music and Performing Arts Center, which is under construction right now, it'll actually be done pretty soon, is a project, it was the first one I ever worked on where virtual reality was part of the entire design process from conception to completion. And so the early on, part of it. You can see this is a very simple model coming from SketchUp. There's no lights or materials or anything like that because the goal here was to evaluate the spatial qualities of different design options. You see a blue one and a green one. And so as we were looking at those and checking out the different sight lines, it was really just about finding which direction felt the best. And you've probably heard people say before that in VR there's this magical thing where you can talk about how it feels as opposed to uh, when you're just looking at 2D drawings where it's a little bit too abstract. And so from there, once we picked our green option, actually, and the design progressed along, we moved, made our way into Revit. Um, I think we're in like early DD phase at this point. We wanted to get a little bit more nuanced about how we were placing the seats inside the theater. And so the way that was done was using a Vive tracker so we could actually have our little Eames chair move around a real physical space. And we could actually basically select different seats because the theater wasn't actually all going to be Eames chairs and pick a spot and kind of move it to you know, a few inches this way, a few inches back, find some new seat locations, and wherever we would make those decisions, we could carry all of that back into the Revit model and have those decisions made in VR be uh, transferred back over. And then there's a few other things here with checking out um, you know, bus style configuration versus swan style, what direction the seats are, up in the catwalks to look at the, the sight lines for the lighting, different stage options, and what you're seeing there, I'll talk about that more in a second, but that's the SketchUp model. As well, so here's a fun, fun little thing where we started to also look at how we could do uh, very nuanced design in, in almost an algorithmic quality inside the experience. So here, the railing actually can be grabbed and moved, and it will change around the whole um, balcony area as you move those different pieces around. It's constrained to stay within the code requirements, but then once you're like, yes, this feels like the most ergonomic uh, situation for that railing and the sight lines are good, it's pretty great to be able to bring all that back and have that be reflected in the final design. So here we are at the end of this kind of Unity experience, and you're seeing the first iteration, SketchUp, then Revit, and then something a little bit, a little bit more final where we're starting to work out material options. And there's something really nice about carrying the entire design process through a single VR experience because you can check back on it and say, you know, six months ago there was something really nice about the way the stage looked, and I think we kind of lost that. And it's much easier to go back and try to recapture uh, some of that design sensibility. But as the design progressed on, we decided Unity wasn't quite getting us the uh, level of visual fidelity we wanted towards the end of the design process. So we actually moved over into Unreal Engine, brought everything over into there, and then started to play with materials and lighting and started to explore, again, just kind of what felt right. Uh, uh, early on, it's easy to make a lot of design choices really quick and just try things out and see what uh, makes the most sense to continue with. And you can even see here, like, we started to have some presets and cycle through some options very quick. This is all inside the Unreal Engine VR editor. 
And then um, I don't think I'm going to wait for the next part, which is just moving lights around and seeing how that changes the effect of the space. But then from in there, sometimes, you know, not everyone wants to put on a VR headset. Sometimes you still just have to communicate the status of a design. So we used the V-Ray for Unreal plugin to start to just crank out, like, OK, we decided we like this red option, we like this blue option. Here's some renders of that, and can kind of show the fruits of the labor in a more accessible manner. So this was our, our first pass at two different schemes. And then a little bit later, kind of went more in this direction. Again, just using V-Ray for Unreal. And then, um, just because we're inside VR already, we started to play with, OK, well, what's it really like to be inside a theater? It's not always going to be empty. And so we played with these different abstractions of what it's like to have people in there. We gave them some different animations, uh, some different qualities you could experience. You can have them be frozen or animated. And uh, <laughs> you'll see in a moment that you can even make them. It's longer than I thought. Oh, they're focused now. I got too quick. I thought I was going to be like right on with this. But they can stand up. No, they're not going to stand up. But you can, make, you can make them give you like a standing ovation, which is kind of cool. There it is. OK, great. <laughs> we got the last second of it. Um, and so here's the current state of a you know, drone flying through the actual project. And I got to say, it was really exciting to see this and start to look at everything from the railings to the height of the balcony and all these little nuanced moments in the design and knowing like, that decision got made from within VR where we felt like we were there. And that's kind of a rare thing. I mean, I've been doing, I did normal, normal architecture from 2007 to 2013 when I first started using VR. And there were a lot of projects I was on where due to a drawing, a flat drawing being misunderstood, bad things would happen. And that leads to change orders and all sorts of other problems. Here's one more example. And then I'm also just going to go, anyone know what this is? This is a dressing room, and that's not what a dressing room is supposed to look like. This is a little bit more accurate, so you know you got the, uh, the top shelf there that's wrong, the lights are on the wrong wall. So again, virtual reality we're finding is helping to make this a little bit better. And then once the building was done, kind of going back to the Macbeth thing, we started to find there were opportunities to use that design of the building for something like set design. And this is when I started to really explore something like Tilt Brush, like a sketchy tool that could actually help work through ideas. So there's that Rice model with the Tilt Brush sketch just in there as a really quick way to evaluate the status. So who knows what this is? This is a napkin sketch, everyone. A napkin sketch, as everyone knows, is the, the core fundamental power in a design. You do a napkin sketch, and then all the brilliance that becomes the building starts from there. And uh, you know, it's, it's a good marketing item. And so I started to think, what's, what's a good version of a napkin sketch in VR? And I started to explore, OK, yeah, like these drawing tools like Tilt Brush, what would it be like to be inside virtual reality and work through a design really quickly, just gesturally, um, almost with your brain off, just kind of, kind of getting a sense of what you want the potential of a building to be. And you're not prescribing wall thickness or anything like that. It's just the ability to walk through a space and then think about what it could be. You know, You have compression and release, but maybe the materials aren't thought out at all yet. And so we started to play with this a little bit. This is actually just a, a school project I had many years ago. But I took that old Revit model and started to explore what it would be like to go inside of that and just work through the interior, because the design was really only thought through with the exterior uh, components. And so I went through and kind of sketched out you know, some different furniture options, how the rooms might be laid out, um, all from within Tilt Brush. So I imported the 3D model. And what's great about Tilt Brush too, by the way, is that it remembers every stroke you do in the order you do it. So when you press play, when a tilt brush drawing is done, you can actually see the design process kind of play out rapid fire, which is, is pretty cool to see. And then from there, I could actually take everything into, say, Unreal Engine again, and uh, do things like mass, mass stuff out, add materials, add lights, and Boy, for anyone who saw the Promethean AI presentation, I sure would love to have a version here where it's like, hey, Promethean, you know, just fill this up with models of things that are kind of like the sketches I made. I'm sure Andrew will get there. It's going to be awesome. And so working through that, what's kind of nice then is you can take all this, this gestural uh, design work you've done and then bring all of that back into, in this example, 3ds Max or Revit, and then have all of that play out as uh, like trace paper almost, where you can then make the more precise version of something using what you sketched out as an underlay. 
kind of like what you do scanning trace paper and putting it inside your model. Um, last project I'll show really quickly in this section is just to demonstrate that there's a lot of different ways to go about this. This was a project where for 80% of the VR work, it was enough just to be in a panorama, a simple V-Ray panorama. The first one was from Tilt Brush, the second one was a massing model, and then the third and fourth were exploring some different material options. And it wasn't until the end where we actually said, oh yeah, let's actually do things like, you know, cycle through some materials there, um, grab furniture, move the furniture around, and then have that have some very direct input into the final design. But for most of the run, panoramas and that one moment coming off the elevator were important. So again, we've been talking about computers and virtual reality, having the decisions made in virtual reality have a direct impact on a building design. And now we get to the exciting part, okay? We're going to talk about computers <laughs> going into virtual reality, and then from in virtual reality, when you design something, having that stay inside virtual reality. This is new territory. We're going into a zone that I am not so knowledgeable about, only excited. So I, I want to share that excitement with you and start a dialogue, and I hope this conversation continues for many years. But we're talking about actual virtual reality architecture, architecture that is designed inside VR and will always be in VR and has no intention of ever being built. Fireballs. So here's the first time I did something like this. This was me jumping in head first, just being like, I like this idea, I want to make something. And so this is the playback of a tilt brush sketch I did. And the whole idea here was like, I want to design something entirely within VR, and it's never going to see the light of day in the real world, but I'm going to start thinking about what are the unique opportunities of architecture inside VR. And so this tilt brush sketch, as you'll see in a moment, I took that and then brought it over into Unreal Engine and then used the sketch as an underlay to mass out everything and add materials and add lights, all from within a VR headset. I, I touched the flat part of the computer very, very rarely during this. And then, you know, I could also do some things like different design options, and it occurred to me, too, that this is never going to be built. I can have all these design options. I can cycle through them at any point in the experience. And then you start to get into some game design logic of, you know, when might you want certain experiences. Um, I also started playing with what would it be like to actually have different furniture options available, so being able to generate models very fast. And then, as you just saw there, a little bit of physics, and just being like, what's something that you wouldn't do in the real world? Break everything. And so turning on a bit of a physics simulation, making it so things can catch fire. And this was all very playful. This was, wasn't very research-oriented, just kind of what's it like to start thinking about existing entirely in virtual reality as an experience, Hulk smash. And so now we're going to get a little more serious. This is when I started to really dive deep into, OK, what's the right way to go about this? Um, who recognizes this quote? Just show of hands. Like, no one. Wow. Okay, Winston Churchill said this, everyone. And Winston Churchill was saying this about the House of Commons. So after the Blitzkrieg in uh, 1943, this was destroyed, and a lot of parliament members were like, oh, we should build it nicer now and have it be a circle and convivial and everyone can play nice. And Winston Churchill said, no, I really like the way the architecture of this room, forces everyone to be very confrontational. It, you know, created this two-party system. Uh, you have the people who are opposed to the government, the people who are for the government, and if you're going to change parties, you walk across the aisle, and it's very theatrical. And this kind of was a, this becomes a touchstone quote for anyone who wants to talk about the way that architecture has a direct effect on us. Because I think when people think of a virtual reality environment sometimes, they think you don't really need anything. It can be empty space, because if you're going to play uh, a game or have a meeting or whatever, you, all you have to do is, is uh, pull up the, the code and have the function that you want to have in that space. But you don't need to keep out the elements. There's not going to be rain or anything like that. So clearly, virtual reality architecture doesn't have that base purpose of shelter. But you know, I point to uh, history. And the thing, obviously, this is Stonehenge, but you can go even further back to, uh, I don't even know how to pronounce this, but Gobekli Tep, Tepe, which is about 9,000 BC. This is, I think, the earliest reference point we have for something that we might consider architecture. Mies van der Rohe said that the first architecture would have been the first time two bricks were put together with intention. Probably happened a little before this. And Le Corbusier talked about the pur purpose of architecture being to defy time and um, not decay. And thinking about that in regards to virtual reality, it's kind of like, well, you make a virtual reality piece of architecture, it's not going to decay unless the server you know, shuts down. So there's, there's some interesting 
thoughts that started to get my brain turning about um, what it means to, to design with traditional architectural principles, but with an eye towards virtual reality. So let's look real quick at a couple quotes that are about real architecture, but think about how it might apply to virtual architecture. First here, we have uh, Renzo Piano saying, architects spend an entire life with this unreasonable idea that you can't fight, that you can fight against gravity. Obviously, in virtual reality, you can. We have Frank Lloyd Wright talking about how, you know, once the building is done, it's done. Not in virtual reality. Rem Koolhaas talking very specifically about theaters. And, you know, I, I like this quote as a theater designer. This is a problem all the time. The ideal acoustic configuration of a theater or, or shape of it is a shoebox. No one wants to be in a shoebox. But in virtual reality versions of architecture, None of this really applies. You can fight against gravity, you can iterate and change the design, and you can make the theater look however you want and still make the audio perfect. Going on with this a little bit more, I'm thinking about something like Louis Kahn's famous quote about, you know, let the brick be a brick, the brick wants to be an arch. And I'm not sure, but what does a, a virtual material want to be? Does a pixel want to be anything in particular? And if so, how do you best express that? With Adolf Loos talking about, um, how the goal of architecture is to take the sentiments of man inside a space and just continue to make it more precise. Kind of back on the Frank Lloyd Wright quote, it's, there's this notion that you can only do that once. But inside virtual reality, you make a, a virtual reality space that people are gonna occupy and function in, and you can have post-occupancy reports for days and keep iterating and changing the design to continually make it more perfect and more suited for the function of that space. And then Frank Lloyd Wright just saying that, you know, a chicken house design should be treated just as sacredly as a cathedral. And that, of course, immediately makes me think of any kind of creative video game like Minecraft or something like that, where people certainly do spend a lot of time building something as simple as a chicken house. But again, because of the, the resource management, obviously in the real world, you're going to build a cathedral. It's going to be incredibly expensive and require a lot of manpower. In virtual reality, one person can be that, that master builder and work through all of this uh, as long as they want and, and with as much creativity and freedom as they want without worrying about some of those real world limitations. Real quick on this again, I, I find myself thinking about Gestalt, which is this notion of having a say in every part of the design. And Frank Lloyd Wright was famous for like sneaking into his houses after people had moved in and like moving the furniture back to where he had it or like removing furniture that people had put in there. And I, I'm actually a little bit surprised that we haven't had more architects in the real world um, playing inside like fully thought out virtual designs because there's so much opportunity for gestalt there because you can design the furniture and lock it down so no one can ever move it. You can make areas off limits where you can see them but you can't actually go through them. You can even make it so that the people in your space have to look a certain way, which, you know, that goes into a different territory of forcing things onto people. But I, I'm surprised it hasn't been done more. I, you know, I'm looking at SOM with their, their moon city and uh, I saw Bjark Ingels at South by Southwest recently talking about what they're doing on Mars and and uh, Bjarka was talking about how the reason why he's excited about something like Mars architecture is because he's a little bit bored with how the rules of the real world never change and he wants like a new challenge. And so I wanted to shout out like, build something in virtual reality. Because again, the, it's a little bit of uh, uh, the wild west in terms of what can be done. We're still so early days with this all. But there are some core principles. When I think about why is it that we still find a cabin to be cozy and safe and you know, thinking about how we used to gravitate towards caves because they've kept us away from predators. And similarly, with being very high up in the air and having a beautiful view that goes for miles and miles, it's the similar notion of being seen but not seen. And again, going back to having this notion that you are safe and comfortable and, and have something over your opponent. And in the same way that we still love salty, sugary foods, uh, even though it's not really good for us, there's this fundamental idea that's in our body, our reptile brain, that just goes back to how we developed many, many years ago. And so, of course, we can't tell our bodies that like, hey, I don't need to eat all this salt and sugar. I'm gonna last the winter, it's fine. Uh, there's a similar thing with architecture where there are certain things that we find pleasing in architecture and our body doesn't really know whether we're in a real space or a virtual one. And regardless of the actual uh, practical function, there's at least an aesthetic pleasure, if not, you could say, a phenomenological one. Architectural phenomenology is, is what it feels like to be inside of a space and having your body interact with it. So similarly, 
uh, your body not caring whether you're in a, a real space or a virtual one. Uh, one that gets referenced a lot is heights, of course. If you are in a very high virtual reality experience, this is Richie's Plank experience, there is a part of your brain that really feels like you're high up, and that was very mean of that guy to do to push someone off that plank. So now, with this in mind, I, I want us to start thinking about to what degree a virtual piece of architecture might want to actually emulate the real version of that architecture. And I think a little bit about going back to, if you remember Toy Story back in 1995, uh, I remember hearing about Pixar having artists where their whole job was just to add dirt and grime and you know little mistakes everywhere because it just made it feel more realistic. And that got me thinking like, do we do that in virtual reality for virtual reality architecture? Or if going back to Louis Kahn's thing, letting the brick be a brick and, and having certain desires, does virtual reality architecture want to be clean and precise and totally flawless? And I think the answer is still no, because, again, phenomenologically, our bodies respond to places that are too samey and too boring and too clean with a certain amount of bleh. And so even though that's kind of what is easy to do in, in computers, um, I don't think it's actually a good idea. By the way, what's playing right now is the, the opening credit sequence to one of my plays back in 2007. This was like the first time I started using SketchUp and was really excited about it. But it's a good reference because all the houses are exactly the same. Um, I'd also recommend everyone check out research done by Jessica Outlaw who did all this, uh, these interviews with architects and other designers going into virtual reality spaces and critiquing them and talking about the problems about them and everything from areas not being lit and not knowing they can go to those areas to some of the onboarding for how you get introduced to a space. We'll talk about a little of that just now. So, right, so going back to this question of do we want to emulate the real world? These are a few different social VR experiences. Right now, most social VR experiences are trying to emulate the real world pretty directly. Something I've noticed, though, in a lot of them is they're being designed by people that don't have a lot of spatial expertise. They're not architects, they're not visualizers, they're not anyone who has spent a lot of time in 3D space. And so, it's kind of the equivalent of McMansion Hell right now. Uh, this is done, for those who don't know, McMansion Hell is a, a really excellent blog that just kind of examines really bad architectural choices and talks about things like, yeah, you know, these columns aren't load-bearing, these roofs make no sense, here's a few others. And I, I feel like that's happening right now. You have a lot of people who are kind of enthusiastic or just making stuff really quickly, and through no fault of their own, they're not making very good quality work. Um, who knows who this is? Just shout it if you know. That's Picasso, guys. That's Picasso's self-portrait at age 15. And of course, as we know, Picasso went on to make things that were a little bit more abstract, nuanced, no, not nuanced, abstract. It was kind of, he was exploring new mediums. And I bring this up because I think as we move into a new paradigm like virtual reality architecture, just as we were talking about film at the beginning, it's important to master the basics. You know, you. Picasso, someone who figured out how to paint in a normal way before then exploring other things. And so I think that's missing right now in a lot of the designs that exist in virtual reality. And so I actually encourage people to read some really good books on architectural phenomenology and design philosophy and aesthetics and start to get some takeaways from them. I've, I'm going to show two pages of these and then another page. And you don't have to take pictures. Just email me and I'll send you my, my book list. And there's a lot in these books that I disagree with. But I, it was really useful to get a response out of me and be like, why do I find that to be so awful? And in some cases, it's things like, uh, you know, it's the machine for living and like, this is exactly the, the way architecture should be. And in situations like this, I also think of Frank Lloyd Wright's Usonian House, you end up it, with it kind of being a failure. In the, for the Villa Savoy, even though I think it's a beautiful piece of architecture, for anyone who doesn't know, the people who actually lived there, the Savoy family, it was terrible. Their, their youngest son almost died because the roof was so leaky and he kept getting sick and catching pneumonia. And so you can theorize all you want about how perfect something would be, but virtual reality is a great opportunity to actually test it at very little cost and very little child death. And I think that's pretty great. One other set of books I'd recommend, these are all books that are primarily about video games and the world of video games, but really compelling chapters, passages that talk about environment design and what it's like to create a space where people can start to tell their own stories and, and interact with each other in a meaningful way. Because virtual reality architecture is, to a certain degree, a game, but it's going to be a little bit less stringent than a game. You're going to let people do a little bit more and have a little more freedom than saying, go from this point to this point, now you win. Um, hopefully there's more nuance to it than that. 
So now I want to show you guys just a few experiences that I think are starting to tackle a virtual reality world uh, well. And, you know, it's too bad I can only show you this in 2D because for all of these, the real magic is when you're inside VR. But this was made by Matt Colley of Barred Light Studios, and this, as you might be able to tell, was based on some Van Gogh paintings, and he was trying to imagine what it would be like to take Van Gogh's reality as depicted through his paintings and bring it up into a virtual reality environment. And what's so lovely about this is it's a reminder that virtual reality does not need to follow the same rules as the real world in everything from the architecture to the, the physics of it all. I love the fact that the lights in this space you know, have that starry night kind of quality because who says that the light needs to behave like normal light? It behaves like Van Gogh light. And when you're inside this world, it's totally convincing. You're, you immediately feel like this is a world that has rules and a logic and it makes sense. And I have probably spent a couple hours in there and I, I demo it to people all the time. Here's a, a world built for VR chat made by Matt Colley, who's actually the current art director of VR chat. He's made a ton of fantastic worlds in there, and he's always looking at how virtual reality can be used well. So in a lot of his worlds, when you start off, the first thing you do is dress code, right? So you, you get out of your leprechaun suit, and you get into an avatar that's a little bit more suited to the world. This goes back to the Gestalt thing. And then, you know, he's someone who never puts stairs in his virtual reality worlds, because why would you climb up stairs? Um, he has things like, cocktail tables, which I, at first I thought were kind of weird, but then when I was in this world with a bunch of people, I'm, I'm mad I didn't get a recording of it, people will naturally gravitate around like cocktail tables because that just goes back into our lizard brain for some reason or just from being at conferences where you just kind of congregate in a social way around tables even if you don't necessarily have a drink with you. But I have actually done an experience in VR where people were clearly drinking while they had the headset on. I was kind of wondering the logistics of that. But um, also here, you know, you can have things like sitting down, you can have certain logic to elements where there's a, a very particular interaction, so there's that nice balance of uh, the rules of the world and telling people what they can and can't do. And then this is um, me and, and my team at Agile Lens along with uh, Alive in Plastic Land exploring virtual reality theater. And so the primary goal here right now has actually been to put on performances inside virtual reality that could not exist in the real world. So we have our actors and they can look however they want, they can fly, they can grow big, they can grow small. And we put on these live events inside our virtual theater that people from all over the world could attend. And this is done in uh, the social world High Fidelity. And uh, what's been kind of interesting about this is, is, you know, we've kept our theater pretty normal, and everyone is sitting down in normal seats just like you are now, but of course, in virtual reality, that doesn't need to be the case. We could be exploring what is the virtual reality equivalent of Sleep No More or immersive theater where everyone is in the space at the same time. Yeah, she's eating him right now. I, I turned the audio off because it's a little bit disturbing, but this is like an improv show happening. Improv is really good in VR right now because if something weird happens, you have talented actors who know how to you know, play it off. Like it's all part of the show. So that's been great. And yeah, and that can be done very easily right now. This is all the equipment that we use for those performances, courtesy of High Fidelity. Thanks very much. And now um, I'm going to leave a little bit of time for questions, but I just have a few other quick thoughts just to go through um, what it means to design inside virtual reality. I'm trying to spark a conversation, and then I want to talk about this for like five more hours with anyone else who's interested. So in budgets, uh, you know, it's interesting because I think people are like, well, in virtual reality, you can build anything. But it's kind of, there are restrictions, just like the real world, but different kinds of things. In the real world, you have cost per square foot, and there's a certain budget to the whole project, and you make the design based on what the uh, client can afford. So even if, if money isn't an object inside virtual reality, you have different kinds of budgets. You have a polygon budget, you have draw calls, and you actually need to make sure that the experience will be able to run at 90 frames per second inside a virtual headset, otherwise people are going to get sick. Context and journey is a big one for me because a lot of people find themselves inside um, spaces after coming from other spaces. The Sistine Chapel is an example where it's an early time I remember the progression into a space being very important because for those who don't know, Yes, the Sistine Chapel is beautiful, but part of the power of being in the Sistine Chapel is progressing through all the tighter, smaller galleries before you get there, and then like being in a forest and opening up into a clearing, you're in this you know, incredible artwork that's so 3D and so lifelike, and there isn't a lot of that happening inside virtual reality right now. Usually the only time you would suddenly find yourself in the middle of a space is if you're kidnapped or in a Liam Neeson movie. But what happens in virtual reality a lot is you spawn into an environment and you're just there and there's not a lot of onboarding or there's no welcome mat, there's no cues to help you get a sense of what you're supposed to do in that space. And that's something that's fairly easy to correct. 
Another thing is the way you move in virtual reality. Teleportation is kind of the, the standard modus operandi for uh, progressing through a space. But the problem with that, of course, is it's not very realistic. It can take the immersion out a little bit. But also, for a space like this, I think about What's some of the things that we do a lot in real spaces uh, with other people? We, we do a walk and talk. We're walking around a space and talking to each other. And that's something that you really cannot do in virtual reality right now. And so it just gets me thinking about um, how do you design a space that maybe has this accessibility element for people who are going to get sick with other forms of movement, um, but then you know still take advantage of what you can do in virtual reality. One problem, though, that uh, Jessica Outlaw, among other people, have talked about is that people will always want to move in a space uh, the fastest way that they can. And so one example in VR of this is a friend of mine really likes playing Minecraft in VR. One is called Vivecraft. And in Vivecraft, you can teleport. And so now he has a lot of trouble playing normal Minecraft because he feels like everything's too slow. Um, I'm a crazy person who bikes all over New York City, and I have a lot of trouble walking in New York City now because that's a faster way to move. So I'm not s giving a solution to this. I'm just mentioning there's a challenge there where if people are used to moving fast throughout a space, then you are going to have a little bit of trouble uh, convincing them there's a better way to do it. So the challenge becomes how do you move in a, a normal way, if possible, through a space um, without necessarily feeling like you're being too directed or too, this is actually made for a video, but you know, you want to make it feel like there's a progression and you have a sense of going from one room to another and how different spaces feel. And one solution that I think is kind of interesting, without going into tons of detail, there's something called mirror neurons, which are responsible for you see someone smile and you want to smile. And I find that this is actually a solution that helps a lot in VR. There's my leprechaun again. But it's when you're going to teleport, your avatar actually kind of, you have an out-of-body experience where they come out of you and they walk a little bit. And there's something about watching that happen that not only, it's great for everyone else because they see your character moving in a normal way instead of teleporting, but for you as well, you can kind of project your soul or something um, moving with that character, so that's pretty helpful. And going back to this notion of accessibility, one thing that's incredible about virtual reality for uh, a huge portion of the population is this notion of giving people experiences that they wouldn't be able to have any other way. If you've been to Fiji and you loved it there and it was amazing, you might not necessarily want to do a VR experience of Fiji, but for someone who is stuck in a wheelchair, has any other kind of limitation that's preventing them from traveling, that's a really powerful way to experience um, something that you otherwise couldn't. And going back to all of our discussions about virtual reality architecture, if those are experiences in worlds that could not exist in the real world, then there's something really meaningful there. And again, thinking about accessibility, there's ways to do it where it's kind of tacked on, like, okay, we made it possible for anyone to use this. And then there's ways that can be a little bit more thought out. So I've been exploring what the VR equivalents of that are. And also there's some great companies like Walk in VR Driver, which allows, say, someone with one arm or someone in a wheelchair to move inside virtual space as though they were um, a person who had all of that functionality, which is pretty great. I'm gonna skip over Wabi Sabi because it's a little too detail-oriented, but ask me about it, it's really cool. It's about beauty and imperfection and all that. And then as we're wrapping up, I'll just mention augmented reality real quick because we've mostly been talking about virtual reality, but I want you all to be thinking about what's going to happen when we start to live in a world where we all have glasses that are projecting information all around us and visual data as well, and some of that's going to be very practical Yelp reviews and whatever, but we're also going to be able to modify the real world to look the way that we want it to look. And a lot of those choices might not even be manual. Think about the way your Twitter feed is curated or Facebook or you do a Google search and it's tailored to your political views or whatever. It's going to be very strange when people can walk around the real world and people, environments, all that stuff is going to be tailored to look a certain way. And uh, Keiichi Matsuda made a really excellent kind of dystopian short film called Hyper Reality that you should check out. That's just one example of some of the perils of that future. So I think there's an opportunity for architects here to uh, make a difference, a meaningful impact as that world starts to develop. And then, super quick, this is a project that I did uh, with Sage and Coombe Architects where we were looking at using augmented reality as a way to um, bring nature into the world. This was called um, Architecture in Conversation with Nature, and this is a, a historic New York home. It's like 150 years old, guys. It's so old for America. And we were playing with uh, all these paintings that had been done there and taking what had been done with the landscapes and bringing them inside the spaces, which was pretty cool. So, you know, there's, there's positive ways to do this as well. People found these all very relaxing and wonderful. And I'll leave you with this quote. We're going to have like a minute and a half left for questions. And 
basically here, what we're saying is that it's an incredible time to be alive and be a designer um, between advances in psychology and neuroscience and design sensibilities. There's a lot we can do, and so I just hope we all manage to do that. And uh, please talk to me more about this. I'm really excited about this topic right now, in case you couldn't tell. And real quick, we can do like one question. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.